Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Elisa Nent. I'm the product manager for neuroscience working at Milton Biotech. And I'm very happy um, to introduce you the webinar about studying the lymphatic system using light sheet microscopy by Ibn Lundgaard. So coming to the solutions that we have, especially for neuroscience, which I think are most interesting for you today. As you can see here in this image, we created this to kind of show that we have several approaches. So on one hand, we have kind of um, a dissociating brain because we have um, a workflow that you can use to dissociate the brain tissue and isolate cells, but we also have on the other hand a workflow for the imaging of the brain, which I think are both quite uh, important um, approaches to study the brain. And um, just very shortly, so that you get an overview, our workflow for this dissociation for the analysis um, starts with sample preparation where we have dissociation kits and uh, the gentle max, like an automated dissociator. For cell separation, we have different microbeads that are labeled magnetic beads to isolate cells. For cell culture, we have media and supplements. And for the analysis, we have a flow analyzer and sorter. But then more important um, for today is our imaging workflow where we have a set of antibodies clearing kit and a nice uh, microscope that I will also explain you further in the next slides, um, which is really working hand in hand and makes this um, approach to study the brain in 3D uh, more easy. So our antibodies, for um, especially for 3D immunofluorescence, um, have a low cost. Uh, they are all fluorochrome conjugated, which gives you um, faster results. So it's easier than uh, working with the first uh, primary and secondary antibody. Um, and they're recombinant and give you reproducible um, data. And um, then for the next step, the tissue clearing, um, maybe most of you or some of you have heard of this. Basically, what you do is you render the tissue transparent. Uh, by this, we add uh, ethanol for the dehydration and the solvent for the matching of the refractory index, which then, as you can see here, turns the brain tissue within several hours almost transparent, making it possible to then analyze really every layer of the brain. We have uh, different uh, tissue clearing reagents like solution and a kit. Um, they are uh, so organic solvent and uh, non-toxic, which means they are quite safe, but still work fast and efficient. We have several protocols that are directly optimized, uh, for example, for the brain and are quite easy to use. Coming then to the ultra microscope um, blaze. So this is also what will be um, later mentioned in Eben's talk. Uh, this is a light sheet microscope. And you can see here some examples about um, when it was used in, in several publications uh, for the analysis of the brain, for example, but also for other tissue. And um, light sheet microscopy actually covers this gap, which you can see here in the um, microscopes that you maybe heard of before, confocal microscopy, two photo microscopy, that cover more the smaller sizes in the cell, let's say, or the MRE that covers directly the whole brain. And then kind of in the middle is this ultra microscope, um, which is kind of showing cell um, structures, but also kind of includes the whole brain anatomy. So you can even track um, connections of neurons or see their location within the whole um, organ. Um, and some features of the place is that um, basically you are uh, able to image large or even multiple samples, um, which means that you have uh, directly a high output and um, but still uh, reduced hands-on time. Uh, what is also um, very nice is that it works fully automated, so that's quite easy. It can be operated by every lab member and um, you don't have to sit so much yourself on the microscope. You can let it work for you. And we have a 
set of different um, optimized optics, uh, which give you a high data quality, but also high sensitivity. So as a summary, and I don't want to take too much time of you today, um, just to highlight that this uh, ultramicroscope blaze is a fully automated light sheet uh, microscope, which can image multiple samples with a high resolution. It has cutting edge optics that provide a high image quality and sensitivity, and is enabling to image large scale 3D um, organs at a high resolution. And and with this, um, I'm at the end of my part. Um, and I just wanted to show you here this nice video of a brain that was imaged with the UM place. Um, but now, actually, I want to continue um, and in the end now introduce to you our speaker of today, which is uh, Eben Lundgaard. So um, Eben is an associate professor at the Lund University and uh, is the principal investigator of a research group of around 12 people that are studying the lymphatic system in the context of neurological diseases. Um, the lab was founded five years ago and has since then published many papers in uh, high impact journals. So um, the lymphatic system is actually quite new and it's an exciting topic that becomes more and more relevant in um, neuroscience. So maybe you've heard of this also before and that's why you are tuning in or maybe you were just interested to hear more about the lymphatic system. Um, but in any case, I'm uh, very much looking forward now to her talk. I think it's a very exciting topic. And um, I think with this, I'm at the end. So even thanks for agreeing to give this talk and the, the, the virtual stage is now yours. Welcome to this LabRoot webinar on the lymphatic system and light sheep imaging. My name is Eben Lundgaard and I'm an associate professor at Lund University. All right, so today I will be talking about what the lymphatic system is, a little bit about why we think the lymphatic system is important in relation to neurodegeneration, then about um, our uh, appropriation of light sheet microscopy and some data using light sheet microscopy that we use to study the lymphatic system in pigs. And then I'm going to go through um, some more considerations that you might want to take into account when you decide on whether or not to use light sheet microscopy. But first, I will actually start talking about the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's produced in the choroid plexus here in, in the ventricles. And this is the ventricular system you see here. Most people know the CSF as a way to measure biomarkers. But how do the biomarkers actually get to the brain? So what you see here is the progression of Alzheimer's in, in disease. But you also see that the first detectable event is the presence of amyloid beta in the CSF. So then that begs the question, how do these biomarkers produced inside the brain actually get to the CSF? This is something that the lymphatic system can explain. So it was discovered in 2012 in the lab of Michael Niedergaard and it is a system of a perivascular influx of CSF. So the CSF is circulating in the subarachnoid space. And when this um, PL surface IVs turn into penetrating IVs, the fluid, the CSF, will actually follow. And you also see here that these IVs are bounded by the astrocytes uh, surrounding them. And we know now that the echo point four channels expressed in the astrocytes are vital for the distribution of CSF from the CSF spaces to the brain parenchyma. So in essence, the lymphatic system um, is this fluid transfer system. First, we have the influx of the clean CSF 
And this in turn mediates clearance of solutes from the parenchyma. So it's a brain clearance system. And interestingly, it's only active in the sleep state. And luckily for us, also um, when anesthetized when, with certain anesthetics that have a, a high proportion of um, delta waves resembling normal sleep. So there are some very interesting uh, links between sleep and regeneration um, that the glymphatic system um, might actually be able to explain. So it was uh, known from previous studies that sleep deprivation in Alzheimer's mice cause uh, exacerbation of the plaque load in these mice. Also in humans, it was later shown that the more hours that we sleep, the less amyloid we have in the brain. So the lymphatic system sparked a new interest in sleep as a way to prevent Alzheimer's disease. So we think that the lymphatic system is also important you know, to study in relation to Alzheimer's disease, for example. And then some links between aquaporin-4 channels which in the brain are only expressed by astrocytes and Alzheimer's disease. Here we see uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, mice of the type, type APP, PS1. And what you see here is that when the mice were crossed um, with aquaporin 4 uh, deletion mice, uh, knockout mice, there was an exacerbation of the amyloid pathology and also the mice showed uh, worse um, uh, cognitive performance when the lymphatic system was inhibited in the aquaporin 4 knockout mice. So we know now that aquaporin 4 knockout um, exacerbates the AD pathology in mice. Also, in, in postmodern studies, Aquaporin 4 localization to the vasculature. So, the correct um, localization of aquaporin 4 was found to be disrupted in Alzheimer's disease patients. So, this is why some of the reasons why we think the lymphatic system is very important to study in order to prevent neurodegenerative diseases. So, now to some of the light shear studies that we did. We have some cleared mice and our ultramicroscope lays light shear microscope. So how do we make tissues transparent? Or we can also ask why are tissues not transparent? So you probably noticed something that uh, when a light uh, when light travels through different uh, kind of um, materials, it will change direction. So here you see, for example, when a light beam is first traveling through air, then it changes direction. When, um, when it enters and exits a you know, gel. So this is the same thing that is happening in our tissues. So this is because of the differences in the refractive indices. So light is both um, absorbed and uh, it is also refracted. So particularly when, uh, when light moves through a, an aqueous solution, which would be inside or outside the cells, and then when they move through a cell membrane that has a high lipid content. So the, the most kind of basic um, premise for, for, for optical clearing is a homogenization of refractive indices. So this will make the tissues appear more transparent. And the basic uh, steps that we use is uh, dehydration, delipidation, the optical clearing, so uh, substitution of 
um, affected uh, indexes using another solution. And then we can use it for light shield microscopy. Interestingly, the first version of optical clearing was actually performed more than 100 years ago um, by the Spalzifals. And um, he uh, used optical uh, clearing in this little bit more primitive form uh, so that he could uh, draw human organs to, um, to use in atlases. Today, there are a number of different um, protocols available. We use the, the DISCO series, and specifically we use iDISCO Plus. And we have substituted uh, one uh, chemical that I will mention later. So, uh, so yeah, this is the general uh, steps, which consist in just changing solutions. So it's a very easy uh, method. And we have substituted uh, dipensile ether for ethyl cinnamide. As ethyl cinnamide has the same effective index, but it is non-toxic. Actually, it's used as a food additive. Then, if you want to clear not organs, but for example, whole mice, you can also do this with a few uh, additional steps. So here we have used the V disco method and we've performed decolorization and decalcification and then our regular steps. And um, here we have also injected a dye in the CSF and um, we can now see this in the whole uh, body of the mouse. And we also see here how the green channel, uh, 488 channel, can be used to obtain uh, structural information. So uh, it has higher background than the other channels. It can be a pain if the fluorophore of interest <clears throat> is in the green spectrum, but if not, it's very good to, to get the whole uh, structure. Okay, so light sheet microscopy. The principle is very simple. And uh, the illumination uh, comes uh, not in the same uh, direction as uh, the lens, but comes perpendicular to the imaging lens. And, um, uh, often you will see illumination from both sides. And then the light sheet is stable, but the sample moves um, up and down so that you can capture the whole, the whole sample. So the newest uh, technology as, for example, the Optimizescope Blaze will use uh, six um, sheets of light, uh, three from each side. And you see how compared to only left or right side illumination, you gain a little bit more detail by using uh, illumination from both sides. And some, some light sheet microscopes also have the software, so they actually adjust um, the light sheet and the imaging. So one image, one field of view is uh, made up by, uh, by many different uh, images so that the light sheet is as focused as possible on that field of view. So this is uh, one of the very new microscopes on the market. Ultramaxcope Blaze that we're very happy with. Uh, and I will go through um, uh, some of the specifications. So here you see our beautifully cleared uh, mice. <laughs> and this is in air, and when immersed in fluid, they become even more transparent. So this is what we used uh, 
for our um, for our light sheet imaging. But I should say here, when we first set up the technique, we were using the previous version, the Ultramax Group 2. Um, and so using the light sheet microscopy to image the lymphatic system for the first time, we felt that it was necessary to run some tests. So here we compared osteofluorin and aesthetics, where we know that the lymphatic system is suboptimally active. And we compared this to uh, ketamine cyanosin um, anesthetized mice, where we know that the lymphatic system should be equally active as in the sleep state. So here we see um, the results from 3D reconstructions. So we found that we were able to reproduce the differences between the isoflurin and ketamine silicine um, in the CCR regimens when we used uh, light sheet microscopy. And we also found that, of course, we could, uh, by sampling the entire brain with uh, light sheet imaging into 1,000 images of the mouse brain, we were able to perform additional uh, segmentations. And we also saw that the lymphatic system was more impaired in the in the dorsal and the anterior parts when using isoflurane instead of. So then, um, going forward, we are interested in using uh, machine machine learning algorithms to investigate the lymphatic system in the entire mouse brain. But uh, so far, we have used uh, we have used a machine learning algorithm to segment out the vasculature. So not the vascular tree, but the vascular tree. So we have seen that in uh, in the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, which is a model of MS, we had observed that these mice were hypoxic. <clears throat> which could be partially diverted um, by inhalation of 100% oxygen. So we wanted to, um, to analyze the perfused vasculature. So we used an intravascular dye that would on, only label the vasculature uh, of the perfused blood vessels. And we saw that um, in terms of the perfused vasculature, we're able to, um, <clears throat> to here for the spinal cord, determine the total perfused length and the perfused radius of the vasculature and the bifurcation points by combining light sheet imaging and machine learning algorithms in collaboration with the Ali Atzerk lab in Munich. Then we also used light sheet microscopy to study the lymphatic system in higher mammals. So besides this obvious difference in size, the, uh, the pit brain here is also a uh, gyroencephalic. So it has a uh, gyri and sulci in between, whereas the mouse brain is lysencephalic, smooth. Also the pit brain has larger arterioles, whereas the mouse brain mainly consists of capillaries. And um, other, uh, other advantages for using um, larger mammals such as pigs is that they have a more uh, similar physiology um, to humans. So, what we saw here in the, in the pig brain was that um, the lymphatic system, and here we are tracking uh, fluorescent CSF, and we're looking at how it distributes to the pig brain. Here we have a coronal slice, and we saw that the CSF dye uh, was very uh, concentrated in these fissures and sulci of the pig brain. And 
what was very important was that the tracer is seen in purple was also localized in the perivascular space between endothelial cells and astrocytes on the outside. So this tells us that the kind of microarchitecture of the glymphatic system is the same. So in larger uh, mammals, when we see CSF distributed to the brain, it also uh, does that in a perivascular manner. Then we did some light sheet microscopy. Now we have you know, the surface of, of the brain. Then we're looking at the inside of the brain. And this is just the, the, the very lowest magnification uh, that we can actually use. So what you see here is this very robust and, and highly regular pattern of CSF influx here in white, we're just moving into the brain. Into the brain is up in this direction. So that's the cortex. And then in the hippocampus, we see here some larger vessels where the CSF tracer was able to move much further than uh, along the smaller caliber blood vessels. And when doing a comparison here, we saw that the, the entry points for CSF efflux was about four times higher in pigs than in the mouse cortex. And uh, we also uh, saw that the CSF uh, traveled further along the larger caliber uh, arterials. So we believe that the glymphatic system is, is not only conserved, but it's also uh, perhaps even evolutionarily enhanced in larger mammals. So to summarize here for the um, parts on the glymphatic system, the glymphatic system is a clearance system that uses perivascular pathways. So it's kind of piggybacking on the vasculature, but it is moving only in the perivascular pathways. Light sheet imaging is feasible um, for glymphatic studies. We saw that um, the salsi and the fishes in the large gyrified brain act as highways for CSF movement. So um, we found that the glymphatic system is evolutionarily conserved, if not enhanced, by the gyrification of large brains. And as I mentioned before, uh, the glymphatic system may provide uh, links as to uh, why uh, sleep and good sleep quality um, is uh, reducing the risk for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So we were interested in studying the glymphatic system um, with the hope to, to find out how it works with the goal to be able to enhance or just sustain this function in aging. And now to some um, considerations. Um, if you if you want to get into light sheet um, microscopy, um, so we'll go through uh, some specifications here and some considerations. First, the size of the sample. So I would say if you're only planning to use uh, a few hundred uh, uh, microns. Uh, say up to maybe 100 microns of thickness, and then you may even use a confocal microscope. But if you have whole uh, uh, organs uh, of, of mice and so on, then um, you can benefit from using light sheet microscopy. So here, so you want to, in terms of the sample size, you want to be able to uh, to, of course, physically fit it into your uh, chamber. And you also want to check the, the travel range of the microscope. In addition to this, we also have to consider the working distance. Because this means 
here for our uh, 1x lens. The working distance is 1.7 centimeters, which is some of the highest working distance for the microscopes out there at the moment, actually. And that would mean that uh, if your sample is 1.7 centimeters thick, then it means to image the bottom, the lens is actually on the top of the sample. So you see how this varies with different uh, magnifications of lenses. Then your resolution. Can you get the resolution that you want? So for this, you want to, of course, look at the, the, the lens magnification, or the total magnification, including the zoom, and your numerical aperture, <clears throat> which give you, gives you this, uh, this maximum uh, resolution. The image quality. The image quality, here you want to uh, look at how many light sheets can you get. So six, this would be three from each side. Then your uh, thickness, this is your light sheet thickness. We usually use five microns. And then is your clearing protocol uh, compatible? Here, you want to look at the compatibility with refractive indices. And often you will find that you can use both the uh, water-based um, protocol or a um, DBE or ethan cinemate based protocol. Then how much throughput uh, can you get? This of course depends on how much you can fit into the microscope, but also uh, in terms of the software, if you can um, if you can set up the microscope for acquiring uh, several samples in one uh, session. So it's more um, automated. Yeah. So the previous uh, ultramicroscope uh, two uh, we had was from Levision Biotech that was later bought by Miltane Biotech. Here we had to split the mouse head in two to, to fit it in the chamber size. Now with the new microscope, we can image the whole head. Now we've injected dye in the CSF and we're moving through the head to the periphery here, from the brain to the periphery, and we're gonna loop back. So we see here the brain in its entirety, and we also see some cervical lymph nodes. So uh, this new microscope has been a big um, improvement in terms of technology for us. Okay, so some more considerations um, uh, here. So, so you can use uh, organ only, for example, with the iDisco protocol, or you can use the whole body. Here you have to um, continuously um, diffuse um, the different uh, chemicals, solutions uh, into the body. Then, um, then what kind of fluorophore will you be using? Do you have an endogenous uh, or injective fluorophore? So we are so lucky to use our uh, CSF injected fluorophores. You may have, for example, um, a reported mouse with fluorescence protein. Uh, and if not, you are of course reliant on antibody staining. But having said that, you might want to be aware that if you use uh, fluorescent reporters, and this includes uh, GFP reporters, you might need uh, amplification of the signal by antibody labeling. Because some of these uh, fluorescence um, proteins uh, are not as bright after the whole clearing protocol. So if you want to use uh, antibody labeling, there's a number of protocols out there. Uh, it is good to check um, in published papers if someone has uh, used antibodies against the epitope that you are interested in, as uh, antibody labeling requires 
uh, optimization for each antibody. And some antibodies may not um, actually work. So here, for example, you can do a methanol uh, uh, test to see um, whether the antibody still works. And uh, if not, you can try another antibody. This is if you use uh, uh, methanol in your uh, clearing protocol, of course, as we do. So uh, some summary here on the light sheet microscopy part. So you want to consider your sample size. If you have a sample size less than 100 microns, you may be able to use confocal. If you use uh, larger sample sizes, you do have to check the, the sample size and the specifications of your light sheet microscope. Uh, several microscopes, they can only image one uh, cubic centimeter. Then, in terms of the clearing protocol, if you use uh, uh, if your sample is one organ, you can get away with a simpler protocol, but you can even clear whole bodies of mice using other clearance protocols. Then you can also consider uh, substituting some of the toxic chemicals, for example. Uh, the dibenzyl ether, which is, a, which is the last step of the Edisco Plus protocols, um, because this means that this will be the liquid that you use um, in the microscope also. So only few um, institutions will have their light sheet microscope uh, placed with ample uh, point suction. So here, uh, you can replace, for example, a DBE to, um, to ethyl cinnamate so that um, you're not exposed to toxic chemicals while imaging. Yeah, consider your fluorophores if you can uh, use um, fire red uh, fluorophores. This is recommended as they uh, penetrate the tissues uh, better. Remember that um, the most autofluorescence you will get on the green channel, so in the GFP spectrum. And um, antibodies uh, will not always uh, work with the clearing protocols, so, so each antibody has to be uh, tested. So it can also be an idea to test several antibodies in parallel. So with that, I would like to thank my amazing uh, team and um, uh, Tekla and um, Marius, uh, Na and Nick have been working a lot with the light sheet imaging in the lab. I would like to thank a collaborator who uh, has helped with the machine learning algorithms for segmenting out the, the vascular compartment, Ali Atuk in Munich. I would like to thank my funding and I would like to thank Labroots for hosting this webinar. <laughs>